Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and this is episode 29, The Formations of the Kingdoms After Rome. We have talked a little bit about the beginnings of Britain alone. The 5th century saw a slow and steady and not so steady breakdown of the Roman society. As the administration on a mass scale starts to fall apart, the provinces of Britain become fiefdoms. No longer is there a central government or possibly a central military structure. The government of the day, likely in the eastern provinces closer to the channel, kept more of the Roman trappings, where, whereas the west likely easily returned to the older ways. Within these changes, local lords and military strongmen and others, with some sort of power base, began to overcome the existing structure of society. In other areas and other places, we have seen that where major power collapses, the structure of society goes with it. Likely, this was exasperated by two key outside elements and one internal one. First, the Roman military retreat took away the police force, the group that dealt with troublemakers, rebels, criminals, and invaders. As they disappeared, in their place appeared to be local militias which struggled against the roaming bands, raiders, and settlers from the north and across the Irish Sea. Second, the Irish and Picts and others had been raiding and settling Britain for a long time. And now, while the Roman professional army left, the replacements were likely locals with no central uniform system or weapons. They were a collection of locals who might have been military-experienced retired soldiers who knew which way to point a sword. Against well-trained raiders, they were going to struggle. Third, the local authorities began to debate about what to do. This seems evident from the comments of Gildas. To quote, a council is held to deliberate what means ought to be determined upon, as best the safest to repel such fatal and frequent eruptions and plunderings by the nations mentioned above. In Gildas's view, it was, at least in some parts of Britain, still a sense of common front. What this could also mean is that, this, is that the heads of local kingdoms or provinces met to agree on what to do about the problem of these raiders and invaders. The Roman thing to do was hire foreigners, mercenaries, to act as federate, and this appears to be what happened. Gildas puts this suggestion down to the Superbo Tirano Vortigerno. Some scholars suggest that this name Vortigern is, pseudon is a pseudonym, but there is evidence that Gern was commonly used in Brythonic proper names, so it may have been a real person. Scholars are less convinced with the documentation of later authors that suggest Vortigern was a high king, but rather a member of or an advisor to an assembly. The fact that Gildas names him as arrogant usurper or proud tyrant gives a sense that he tried at some stage to launch a takeover. Either way, he has no patience for him, and, along with the assembly, is considered lesser for bringing a group of Anglo-Saxons to Britain. Vortigern is the scapegoat for all that comes after. Ancient Welsh literature, history, annals, tales, and legends, like that of Ireland, abound with references to invasions of Wales and other parts of Britain by Irishmen. Claims have been made that the Irish settlers dominated the land of the southwest and northwest Wales. When we talk of the kingdoms of the late antiquity, the Irish feature. The Welsh kingdoms begin likely where the provinces change from civilian to military rule. Likely this happens in the early 5th century, the Assembly of Vortigern may have been the final act of a united British people, or possibly an assembly of small nobles in a district closer to the eastern British lands. We know that Gildas was muddled about some information on earlier Roman British history, either for the storytelling or because the growing years led to confusion. So one is left to wonder if the Vortigern Assembly, instead of being something of a 5th century invention, is rather something that happened in the mid-4th century which would make some sense as this was during a massive invasion from the north and the west and led to what some scholars describe as the end of the villa system in Britain. Certainly, the mid-5th century, the marble buildings of earlier times began to decay and fall into disrepair and dis disuse. Archaeologists have also noted that coinage fell off again at the end of the 4th century. So much of what held Roman Britain together disappeared in around a generation. The Welsh kingdoms that grew up in this period of darkness may have been little more than old tribal loyalties, or, as I said earlier, strongmen centered around a regional power of military. In this vacuum, the British kingdoms of Goth Gedothin, Demonia, 
control the areas of South Antonine Wall. Regget controlled the areas near Blackpool. Almut and Eboracum controlled Yorkshire. The most powerful kingdom in Wales for many centuries, Gwyneth, rose in this period, as did Powys and Ceredigion, Erging and Glusing, in the Irish-controlled southwest of Wales, and in the kingdoms of Dimet, Brehainyog. The Cornish British controlled the kingdoms of Demonia and kept contact with the outside world, including the Romans and Eastern Empire, from their trade at Tintagel. The kingdom south of the Antonine Wall, also known as Gedotin, which may have derived from the old Iron Age tribe called the Votadini, south of the Antonine Wall lay a people known as the Manau Gothin. Nennius identified this kingdom as the source of Kneda, a tribal leader of the Manau Gothin, called to Gwyneth to lead the people there. He settles near the site of Canarfin, across the river from the old Roman fort. It was claimed at this point that he had driven off the Irish raiders and was made king of Gwyneth. Saguntium was abandoned in 390, so the Romans were long gone. Nennius says that Cunetha drove out the Akati, who had long time been a thorn in the side of this settlement. Cunetha then is purported to have married Gual, a daughter of Colhen, from the kingdom of Aboricum. Their son, Keridig, and Meridon are the legendary founders of Caridigion and Merionith. The kingdom of Godothan was destroyed by, North, by Northumbria in the 7th century. Powys, on the other hand, controlled the area around the old hill forts of central Britain. The old Roman province based around the Civatas of Viconium, Coronovium. Powys is a name gleamed from the Latin word Pegas, the countryside, or possibly Panicius, dweller of the countryside. Nennius claimed the founder of Powys was Vortigern, the proud tyrant who encouraged the landing of the Saxons. In other words, the kingdom was devalued at its founding. But we are also talking about the opinion of someone who is writing for the Gwyneth histories. Another name mentioned is Cadell Thirenzug, uh, also known as Cadell of the uh, Golden Hilt. Some speculate that Cadell and Vortigern united their kingdoms through marriage and created a later kingdom of the mid-century. If Vortigern truly was the leader in the area around the time of the end of the Roman period, it would make sense that there would be an assembly of nobles based around the old Civitas, debating what to do with the ratings in Britain. In the south, the kingdoms of South Wales were much smaller. Some, like Gluissing and Brinchenog and Gwent, arose around the old Roman forts at Caerleon and Cardith, in the old tribal Siluri lands. Gwent, based in Carwent, was established by the legendary king Cardoc Fairfres, meaning strong arm. These southeastern kingdoms have little historical information to go on beyond the legends historically. The last Welsh kingdom of this period are based in the old tribal lands of the Demente, and named in the late Roman period was known as Desi, which eventually became known as the kingdom of Dyfed. Desi were migrants from Ireland in the 4th century. The kingdom stretched as far as Swansea, and Gaelic was the major language during the 5th century, pointing to their Irish roots. Their kings claimed to be descendants of Magnus Maximus. It was also suggested that Magnus may have been the one who allowed the Desi to settle in Dyfed. Trifin, Mac Ade Brosk, was apparently the first king of Dyfed from the house Eochad. Achet Armil. His name means tribune, showing his Roman ancestry and or military position, also called Trifin Farfog, the bearded. Part of the reason why Gwyneth becomes the kingdom we know as much as we do about it and we have much more historical ground upon is simply because the historians, the chroniclers, much of the writings that we have survived the time periods later on. Kingdoms, of course, in Wales started to collapse and started to become amalgamated into English kingdoms or were fought over several times and, and changed or they merged into various pseudo-bigger kingdoms uh, and in sometimes larger, much more stable kingdoms. But the reality of it was is that 
Gwyneth is going to be the focus of much of our podcast for the next few episodes. It is the one that we have the most information on. And certainly once we get closer to the end of the millennium, the, uh, to the end of the first millennium, we will have a lot more to say about what's going on there. And we'll have a lot better understanding of what's going on there. So keep that in mind as we go, that things are going to be a little sketchy in some parts of Wales at this point. Now, that could be down to a couple of different things. One is it could be the literacy issue. There may not have been enough people writing in the area to know and follow the kings of that neck of the woods. It could be also the simple fact that there were writings because, of course, there were monasteries around there. And there may have been chronicles kept, but they were destroyed for various reasons. I mean, not all of what has been written do we have today, even as far back as a few hundred years ago. We, in some ways, are lucky that we have what we have. But the other problem, of course, being the English invasion and then eventually the Norman invasion, and then eventually, on top of everything else, the switch of the churches from being controlled by uh the Catholic Church to becoming an Anglicized church and the destruction of the monasteries thereafter probably meant we lost a lot of what we could have had. And the reality of it is I don't think English monarchs would have been terribly excited about old dead Welsh monarchs and probably a lot of the records that would have been kept probably were destroyed and we just lost them. So unfortunately, it really limits our perspective on things. Uh, we know for a fact that this is something even Gildas in the sixth century is complaining about just the lack of material and like i said it could come down to the fact that there was just too much going on the age was too destabilizing there just wasn't the ability to write for most of the population so there wasn't you know a wide variety of sources and then secondly you don't have a large uh, academically trained populace and combined with that you know the the usual people at this time period that are writing are monks. And so if they don't have a safe place to write, if writing is happening on a constant basis, if you're, you know, we, we honestly don't know how much we lost when the Viking raids happened, for example. So we don't know how much we lost when the Irish raids happened or any of these other raids or assaults on various monasteries, which were well known for being wealthy areas to steal from. And how much we lost from those from those destructions alone. And so we are left in darkness in a lot of respects with some of these. This is why I mentioned some of the legendary people. Because realistically, they probably are legendary. We may not really know who these leaders were. The idea of Powys being the center of the kingdom of Vortigern may simply be a black male or a black eye for Powys from Gwyneth. Gwyneth being, of course, their their longtime enemy who eventually will merge them into what becomes the very short-lived Kingdom of Wales. So they're not well regarded, they're not well respected, they're not kept in high regard because, you know, they're the enemy. And the same goes for other kingdoms in Wales. The other problem you have, and, and we're going to get into this quite a lot as we talk further into this, is you have a different Welsh custom from the English customs wherein in English customs, the oldest child gets everything. If the, the parents die, it's, it, it was the case that the oldest child would be the inheritor of everything. So when we're talking kingdoms, of course, the oldest child would become the next king of England, or queen as the case may be. In Wales, it didn't work like that. Each child got their portion, much like how it works today for most people. And because of this, it also divided the kingdoms, because obviously if you had three or four children, all of a sudden you got to divide the kingdom amongst them. And this created chaos as well, because often it would then weaken those kingdoms and they would struggle. And then combined with that was the fact that the, Angli uh, the English kings and other kings would then try and sort of create favorites and try and motivate them to fight amongst themselves so that they could divide them up and and we will see more of this as we go through these confrontations and how they worked but this is the basis of the kingdoms that were set up in the fifth century these are what come from the roman traditions likely they started out as old provincial locations that were controlled at one time by roman administrations uh, then merge into these tribal leaders or possibly 
through administrators or military heads that stayed in Britain after the end of the Roman period, these people would have been able, either through money, likely not so much money, but through land, through relations, through power, to control the area. Maybe they were the local thug, who knows? And eventually they come to power. Now in the case of Gwyneth, because again, we're telling this story from their perspective, you have this idea that this old English kingdom, or old English kingdom, this old Brythonic kingdom in, you know, an area north of the Hadrian's Wall would send a leader down to run their country, that they would drive out the invaders, that the Irish would be gone, and and they would drive out the Saxons, and they would become the predominant power in the area. So because of these perspectives, it makes sense that they would talk of their leadership and of their ancestors as being great, strong, and and mighty men. And it's it's very common in the way we tell stories. We always kind of look at our own memories and our own things in, in a different perspective than we do other people, right? If you don't like someone, they're always typically the bad guy. They're always typically not going to do the right thing. They're always going to make the mistakes. You're always going to see them as in the wrong. And your memories will drive that idea. And it's kind of the same thing for countries. I mean, if you think about it, the ideas that the United States and, and the Western world had about the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union had about the Western world were predominantly told by their own uh, governments. And so you have perspectives on the people that are different from what probably would go on in those places if they actually went there and observed them. You know, obviously there it serves those governments to have that idea of propaganda, as we would call it. And that's effectively what these stories are. These foundational stories are propaganda. They're to show the purity and the rightness of their foundation, and thus the reason why they've become powerful. It justifies who they become because, you know, look where we were. We were so blessed or so driven or so god intervened in our behalf to make sure that we became the power source of the area and honestly that is very common and it's as common today as it was back then and history is colored by these ideas propaganda is key to how everything works <laughs> and we even today tell ourselves stories about ourselves that are based upon ideas which may be false or may be colored at the best of perspectives. And just because it's 2016 doesn't mean we don't still do this. And so I think we have to forgive these people for what they say, but yet take what they say with the grain of salt that we should. And understand, again, that we're getting perspectives that aren't necessarily the reality. And of course, Gildas has his own point of view and is colored by that. It's largely religious. Nennius has the religious and the political that he's arguing with. And you have the Anglo-Saxons and Bede with their own versions of that. And we'll continue to confront this even in later periods of time. So it's up to us to, to evaluate. It's up to you as the listener, to be fair, is if you go and read about these things, you may come up with totally different opinions than I have. Um... But certainly there is some validity in what they're saying. It's not all rubbish. There's definitely things here that in the foundations that do make sense, that do explain to some degree what went on. It's just we don't know how much of it is true and how much of it we can trust. But we'll do our best to kind of pluck the wheat from the chaff. We'll try and make sure that everything is as clear as possible and try and make sure that we're telling stories that make sense, but also are as truthful as we can. Um, we'll try and give some perspectives from various points of view as we go. One thing I will say is you, one aspect of this that you have to question and wonder about is if you're a poor person living during this period, is it rougher for you or is it the same? You know, has it really changed a lot? You your perspective basically is is that while the leadership changes, maybe there's prob more problems because you've got 
raiding and and pillaging going on so you're probably losing items but is it worse than the ta than an overburdening of taxes that was happening in the late era of the roman empire where emperors and and usurpers were coming and going like crazy and the taxes were going like crazy and you are left to wonder at times if that's largely the reason why britain had finally had enough and once things started to decay kind of jumped off fully there is a letter which is claimed to be from the emperor honarius in the mid fourth fifth century which claims to be aimed towards the island of britain telling them to seek for themselves because they couldn't help them now there's some debate amongst historians about how if that's really aimed at britain or if that's aimed at a part of italy which has a similar name and that debate be what it is but the reality of it is, is by then, Britain had long ago given up on them. Now, again, we're going on the written history, and the written history says that at this point is when the Saxons arrive. But likely, the Saxons are already there long before that. But it may be that they started to kick off and become a real problem around then. Or possibly they were starting to migrate in much bigger numbers at this point. And we're going to get into that further next week, uh, in two weeks, I want to say. Uh, we will talk further about the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, and others who arrive. And what they mean to Wales and to Britain as a whole. And how they arrive, and likely how things began and then how that created the conflict that came after it and then we'll get into other things as we get into the new year i want to wish you all happy holidays um and a happy new year i i'll obviously say that again in the next couple episodes but uh i hope it's a good one for you and uh, next week will be a little bit different i'm, I'm going to look at some things ordering around the holiday period and it may be that We'll just do a sneak preview of some of the later stuff. Or possibly I'm looking at some of the traditional ideas and kind of going to put those forward since the next episode comes out on the 23rd. Uh, either way, I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you've had a wonderful December so far and that you get an opportunity to spend time with people you care about. Uh, and be good to one another and we'll see you later. Thanks a lot, everyone. And you can contact me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can contact me on Twitter at uh, John DMP for my personal Twitter account or at Welsh History Pod. Uh, I love feedback. I like it when people are correcting me on my pronunciations or offering me advice on how to pronounce things. I continue to struggle and work on them, and I will try and continue to get better at this. Anyway, until next time, we'll talk to you all later. Have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.